Blog Talk Radio.
Again, thank you so much for joining me here tonight. This is a very special evening here on Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour. My name is Jesse Ann Nichols-George, and I am your hostess. The music you were listening to there at the beginning of the show is from tonight's guest, Peter Cater, and it, it is called Ascent. And I just want to extend a welcome, whether you're joining us here for the first time or whether you're returning and you've listened to our show in the past, here at Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour, I look at the different ways that compassion exists in our lives, how to remove our blocks, resistances, frustrations, and more. Some weeks I'm discussing different aspects of how compassion is in our life and how it affects our life, and also the different areas of compassion. And then some weeks I'm doing more exercises, practical implementations, and basically this year is really completely filled up with guests, so I'm really blessed about that. I also highlight different musical artists along the way. Earlier this year, we had Stephen Halpern, and of course, tonight's guest is Peter Cater. Also, um, from there, we just have a variety of different things that happen on the show. And to give you a little bit of insight about my own work of what I do, is I focus on helping people find and use compassion in their everyday lives. I created the Genesis Clearing Statement, which some of you have experienced on previous shows. And if you've missed that, you can definitely catch it in our archives. A great show to catch that on is last fall around September with Kevin Baird, where he interviewed me um, just before I started my own show here on Main Street Universe. And uh, we go through the Genesis Clearing Statement on that show. I've authored two books titled Activating Compassion and then also Activating Compassion, the workbook. And I'm soon to be releasing my next set of books, which will be based on relationships. I've also created the Compassion Tour, which is a multi-state nationwide tour, which includes workshops, retreats, seminars, book signings, and fundraising events. And um, so there's lots of different things that I work on and do. And just a reminder, if you do enjoy the show tonight, which I know you're going to enjoy it, (laughs) then make certain that you tell your friends, your family, share it with those connections that you've got out there in the social world because I know they're going to want to come in and listen to this show. They can always listen to it at the very same link in our archives, and they can just come right into that. Also, all of the archive shows are located in a couple of places. On my website, in the Main Street Universe tab, I've got my own tab on there as do all the hosts. You can catch the archive shows there as well as at facebook.com forward slash activating compassion, forward slash notes, and all the archive shows are there as well. Now, before we get started, what I like to do, as some of you know that have listened to the show before, is I'd like to delve into The 72 Names of God by Yehuda Berg. Wonderful book that gives us some wonderful little insights and thoughts. And every week I take this thought and I post it onto the Main Street Universe page, on my page there, And um, that way you can actually go back and read it during the week if you'd like to. But I randomly open up to the book, and it always gives us a wonderful message to kind of carry through into the week with. And let's see what we've got tonight from Yehuda. Now, Yehuda is giving us a message tonight, or the name that he's sharing tonight with us from this book is Absolute Certainty. And the message underneath that is, There's only one way to render all tools and power in this book inoperative and worthless. It is called uncertainty. And his insight on this is he has a dictionary entry for uncertainty principle. One, a principle in quantum mechanics holding that increasing the accuracy of measurement of one observable quantity increases the uncertainty with which other quantities may be known. Developed by theoretical physicist Werner Heisenberg in 1927. Two, part of the present scientific view of the nature of physical reality with implications or philosophy in general. And he goes on with his insight to say, if we inject doubt into any aspect of these teachings, we literally pull the plug and shut them down. I'll believe it when I see it, must be replaced by I'll see it when I believe it. And remember, certainty is not confidence, that is not just confidence, that is, um, that we'll get what we want, 
certainty means recognizing that we are already getting what we need for spiritual growth. It's true that when hardship strikes, doubts begin to surface in our minds. We become uncertain about the reality of the Creator. We question the justice in the universe. We fear for the future. We point the finger of blame at others or toward the heavens. But when we invoke the power of certainty, all these negative sensations fade away like fog shrouding a steadfast mountain. In every area of life, the duration of chaos and pain is always directly proportional to our own degree of certainty and responsibility. And the meditation that he shares with us on this is certainty, certitude, conviction, sureness, trust. All these fill your heart through meditation upon this name. And the way that the name is pronounced, of course you can always say absolute certainty, but <laughs> the name that actually goes with this is Ayan Yet I'm sorry, Ayan Resh Yud. Okay, that's Ayan Resh Yud. And again, you can read this for yourself. I will have it posted shortly after the show um, on my main website, which is Jesse and Nichols George One. That's the number one dot com. Now, in past weeks, I've looked at the different influences that music has had in our lives, and there's many things from energizing us putting us on certain brain waves, awakening cultures, influencing moods, and so on. And we are aware that music can be used for a variety of different purposes, but what about the actual energy that we feel from the music? Why does some music that is supposed to be healing for us have an effect and others don't? Why does some music seem to really transport us or allow us to be completely focused in that music in that moment? while others don't. Well, this week I want to look at a component of music that equates, equates with practitioners that are walking their talk and those that don't. There is an energy that happens when someone presents information that they live by and those that just present the information. For example, two people say to you, great job. One person says it because they feel it's what they're supposed to say, and it's part of just common courtesies. And they don't really have feelings about it, but are more concerned that you don't think poorly of them for not saying it. So it's about them and not you. Another person says the same words, however, they're really excited for you, and you know they truly mean it from their heart. They don't feel any obligations. They're just happy for you. And they want to compliment you so that you can hear it from others besides knowing it within yourself. Now, I feel that music is the same way. The same song can be played, say technically, the same notes, same tempo, that's stimulating the same brainwave patterns even, but one of them touches your heart and one feels just like a song. A musician plays somewhere, say, on an open field, and with one musician, you just feel music being played on an open field. And with the other, you're transformed from the field completely to the music. You merge into the present space so fully that you are one with the music, no longer distracted by space. To me, there's one thing that separates them, and that's the energy of the musician. Yes, the music still needs to carry its part, but it's the motion, the lifestyle, the person that's behind the music that creates the energy we feel. And another example of this is someone who prepares a meal and let's say, you know, they're really upset and they're angry and they have all these heavy emotions going into that meal. And the guests or the people eating that food maybe don't feel so well afterwards. But another time they prepare it with love, excitement, enjoyment, and the guests are satiated, delighted, and everything digests well. And that leads us to realize that there's more to the music than just music. There is the person and the spirit behind the music. My experience is that when someone is living a life in spirit, that they are in flow with spirit in a way that they create, that what they're creating really touches people in a unique way. And when they're not connected, they tend to have 
to market and force themselves into the lives of other people instead of just being invited in. The energy comes from where it is created. Now, Peter Cater finds this with his music, and we can see it in his music. He has said that there is a peacefulness that he lives his life by, and his music is created from that space. Is it any wonder that this has led him to be a seven-time Grammy nominee? Is it any wonder that when you listen to his music, the peacefulness comes over you? The energy that he puts into his music is like the magic ingredient in a recipe. It is the aspect of feeling so good that you want to share that with others. What music has stirred within you and what music has connected you strongly with spirit and the present moment in a way that you are willing to let go of the other distractions around you, letting your mind fully indulge into the sounds of that music? And do you feel that music is more than just notes strung together? And have you felt the energy of music and taken the time to know the person behind the music? And we're going to do that tonight. We're going to get to know Peter a little bit better here tonight. And this week, our guest focuses on a component of compassion that's related to the aspect in my books of seeing with your heart. With this aspect, we are the change that we want to see. And if there is something that you really want the world to get, know, learn, or experience, becoming the essence and living in that vibration speaks louder than any words. My guest tonight brings out his way of life in his music, sharing the things that are important in his life so that others also have the opportunity to experience it. And I'd like to bring my guest on. His name is Peter Cater, as I've mentioned. He's a multi-platinum selling pianist composer. He has received seven, seven Grammy nominations in the last eight years for the Indie Best New Age Album Award and one for his critically acclaimed album, Migration, with Native American flutist R. Carlos Nakai. Peter also contributed two songs to the wildly successful Sacred Spirit recording, which sold over 5 million CDs worldwide. The majority of his albums have appeared in the top 10 of national airplay charts and in the top 20 billboards, New Age, and Contemporary Jazz charts. Peter has scored over 100 television programs and films, including 11 off-and-on Broadway plays. He is a proud recipient of the prestigious Environmental Leadership Award from the United Nations. Peter has also received the 2008 Toastmasters Communication and Leadership Award and the 2008 Native Spirit Award from the Indian Summer Music Awards. And we will be discussing his work and how it connects us with our spiritual selves tonight. And you can learn more about his work by simply going to his website, which is www.petercater.com. And I'm going to go ahead and get his mic opened up here, providing the system wants to let me do that. We're trying here, I promise. <laughs> there we go. Peter, yeah. it's a real pleasure to have you here tonight on Activating Compassion. Thank you for giving us your time. Hi, Jesse. It's a pleasure to be here. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly well. Are, are we listening from my phone or from Skype? We're listening from Skype right now. Okay, great. So. Well, good. Nice to be here. <laughs> It's it's great to finally hear your voice and and have you live. You know, it's it's always interesting when I'm working with a guest and I have these emails going back and forth and you get the energy and you get the vibrations, but you know, when you actually hear the voice it's like everything connects together finally. Right. <laughs> I I agree. <laughs> I would love for you to start off by giving us a little bit of insight on your journey into music, and because I understand that even though you started at a really young age getting into music and doing music, it wasn't necessarily always what you thought you wanted to do. Um, no, at first I was you know, really not all that into it, but that's because I was playing classical music and playing music that I wasn't really that excited about and um 
I didn't really start really enjoying it until I was a teenager and started writing my own music. And um, that, to a large degree, was just very personal about me. And I found that the more that I got personal with the music and the more that I wrote and played stuff that just felt really good to me, then the more it seemed to resonate in other people as well. And uh, and the more I was being asked to play publicly or play for friends or even do some recording. Um, but I've been doing it, you know, for so long now, it's hard to even think about what it was like when I didn't do it. So, so much a part of me. And I think that's quite a, a shift because I, I remember when I got in and started reading about your bio and your information, you you had a lot of journeys getting to where you managed to get up to the point that you are now. I mean, you. Uh, I think I remember reading cross-country trips, hitchhiking across co- country and different things like that and um, journeying from different places. I, I believe, if I remember correctly, you were raised in Germany, but then you went to New York and then you migrated west from there. Yeah, I was born in Germany. I grew up on the East Coast to some degree. I used to spend all my summers in Europe. And then uh, when I turned 18, I moved to Colorado. But then I also, like you said, I hitchhiked around the country. I did like 30,000 miles on the road hitchhiking in about a year and a half. But it was all, you know, it was all like an exploration of self. You know what I mean? My music, I still don't even really see myself as a musician, even though it's primarily what I do in the world. But for me, my music is, is an expression of of my life, of my inner life, of my seeking and finding, of my longing, of my my happiness, of my discontent. I mean, my music is just, it's just whatever it is that I'm going through, that's what my music is expressing. And earlier you were talking about peacefulness. I think, and I probably did say that, but I think really authenticity and honesty and genuineness is probably really I think at the core of what I go for when I'm when I'm playing the piano or writing music or you know recording a, a CD for the healing arts or something like that you know it's it has to be 100% true and honest and authentic I, I can't be pretending to be peaceful or pretending to be loving you know I have to really be in the center of that place otherwise like you said it's just words and I feel like that's such an important message because people look at things and and they think, "Wow, here's this here's this person who's made all of these achievements," and yet at the same time, you know, they're they're sitting back wondering, "How do I get my own things going?" And everybody has their own piece, whether it's music or whether it's workshops or reggae or or whatever it is that they're working on that they're bringing into the world and. And focusing on and and you make such a good point that as you're moving forward in this process as you're growing as you're developing to really be in tune with what feels good when you're doing it what can you do on that 100 percent authentic level and I know that we all kind of tend to go through some things where we do something to pay the bills here and there but you really know the difference when you step into it and you and you're doing what you know is you and is an extension of you um, it it's just a completely different place it's a completely different place from what I see yeah I agree I mean you can feel it you can feel it resonating you know and i and I feel that in an evening of of uh, playing music if I'm doing a concert, you know, I can tell when I'm totally in the zone and totally playing from that, that complete place of surrender versus when I'm looking for it or trying to find it or, you know, settling down into it. I mean, there's there's a completely different feeling when you've just lost yourself in the current. And that's what I think all artists, go for and I think that you know anyone can really experience that in their life and in any way in any context that that they want to you know whether it's 
writing or jogging or or gardening or talking with someone or being intimate with someone or you know what I'm saying? Absolutely, and I think you used a really key word in there, which is surrender. You're surrendering mm-hmm. to that moment. You're surrendering to that experience. You're surrendering, and, and in that space, that's where it really channels through us, and it really yeah. comes out. I, I notice that when I write, and mm-hmm. when I just stop and I surrender, and I, I don't worry about everything else that's going on, I get in that zone, and Boom, there it is. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually writing a book on um, healing through creativity. And uh, one of the main points that I make in the book is that, you know, just good luck trying to be creative. Because <laughs> <laughs> because just, just, that whole, just that whole approach in the first place is totally self-defeating. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like it's... Creativity is, you know, expressing oneself is like you said, and I said, it, it's a surrender. It's a, it's a letting go. It's a, you can't, con- you can't control it. You have to drop into it. And um, you can always tell when someone's trying to be creative, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's kind of like that person following the the forced marketing plan versus the person who's just out there going. Hey, let me share this, and here I am, and take it or leave it. <laughs> yeah. Um, the very different things. Well, I want to share a song um, from from a piece of your works here, and and I kind of saw this as um, connecting with some of your roots and your story a little bit, um, because it involves classical and jazz music, from what I understand. And um, the piece that I was going to share here is from your CD, In a Dream. And the, the title of the song is What Lies Within. So oh, I'm going to yeah. go ahead and get that on here, because that's where your foundation started from.
that was um, Peter Cater's piece, What Lies Within, from his In a Dream CD. And um, that's kind of a good example, I think, of, of where some of your roots came from, developed from that classical and jazz style. Um, does that bring back any memories for you in particular? That song? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's one of my favorite songs from that record. That was my first collaboration with um, sting guitarist Dominic Miller. He's playing acoustic guitar. And um, and my friend Kenny Loggins sang some of um, those, those vocals, you know, those vocal beds. And uh, Jacques Morellenbaum, fantastic cellist from, from Rio de Janeiro. Um, Dominic came to visit me in California when Sting was on tour with the police. And... Uh, and we recorded a record, and we, we got together and basically had nothing. So we had seven days to record an album. So every day we would write a new song. And uh, so this song I I wrote, actually wrote, improvised the piano part early, like 7 o'clock one morning before we got there. And I just recorded the piano part. And we didn't record it to a click, so it had kind of a loose feel. And... Uh, and so then Dominic played on it, and then uh, we sent it down to Brazil, and, and uh, Jacques played on it, and then I flew out to, uh, I didn't, actually, I was in California, I went to Santa Barbara and recorded Kenny's stuff. And uh, it just, it, for me, it had a really soulful, it's like a timeless quality, you know, it's kind of like, it's not it's not classical, it's not jazz, kind of has sort of a folk kind of feel, you know, I don't know, it, it feels like a really good heart-centered song. I'm, I'm, I really like that song. I I have to agree. I mean, there's such a flow to it, and it's um, it's not what I think of as traditional classical by any means or traditional jazz, but it's it does definitely have that flow, and it is just very free going. And I know what it takes to get in and record these pieces and things. So the concept of putting this together in a week <laughs> for a whole CD and bringing these people together is is a pretty amazing thought to to think about. Um, well, and and I came back there in the California coast myself. I grew up in Manhattan Beach and have a lot of friends around Santa Barbara and spent several years in the Central Coast, so I'm quite familiar with with that whole range out there. Mm. It's, it's all inspiring. Of, it's all part of the creative process, you know. It's just not it's not just when you play the instrument. It's 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 all aspects of it from um, deciding, you know, who should play on it and what they should play and um, the the process and the, the sequence in which things happen. I mean, it's all it's all part of the same energy and the same – comes from the same place, you know? And mm-hmm. so oftentimes when things really fall together really well like that, it's because they're just connected. They're just hooked up. And you, and you do. You find those – those connections and they do just really flow together. Um, and when you connect with those people, and and you just can tell. You know, it's kind of like we were talking about earlier with surrendering and the authenticity. You can just tell when it clicks together. Um, there's mm-hmm. no question in your mind about it. Um, absolutely mm-hmm. beautiful. Now yeah, I know that there's nothing going on in your mind. <laughs> there's nothing. That's exactly it. That's that space we always talk about. You're just blank. You're not thinking about anything at that point. You're just experiencing, and it's amazing. Mm-hmm. And I think about that because people do. They oftentimes they say, "Well, how do you know that you're there? How do you, you know, make this happen?" And I'm like, "You don't make it happen. You, you receive it. And and when you're there, you don't have a question as to whether you're there or not at all." Um, mm-hmm. You absolutely know it. So mm-hmm. now you also draw a lot of your inspiration from nature, and mm-hmm. what is it about nature that brings so much inspiration to you? Because it is our our most essential self to some degree. I mean, nature, everything is is nature that isn't man made. So it's it's kind of like getting closer to our roots and origins and our most essential self, you know. Um, I, I think I, if I can quote myself, 
from a, a record that I did years ago called Soul Nature, it occurred to me that we find ourselves in nature because it is our nature to be soulful. And um, I just really, I, you know, it's, it seems like a natural thing to me. You know, it's like, why wouldn't we feel more nourished and more at home in the most natural of, of settings, you know, which is why I love, you know, living in Hawaii so much. And I'm looking forward to going back there because it's, you know, it's this group of islands, you know, several thousand miles from any, you know, mass of land in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And the predominant energy there is nature, even though, you know, there's tourists and there's hotels and, you know, in Oahu there's high rises. Still, the predominant energy is by far nature. So there's a there's a peace there. There's a there's a, a presence there that um, people feel, even though they might not identify it exactly. And I think the whole world used to feel that way, you know, before it became you know industrialized and overpopulated and polluted and all that kind of stuff. Not not to bring the energy down here too much, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I get really upset every time I see those chemtrails go across the sky. I'm, oh, I'm yeah. pretty passionate about that myself. Yeah, don't don't get me going about that. <laughs> don't get yeah. us going on the chemtrails. <laughs> no. But I I very much agree with you, and I I do understand. We used to vacation a lot in Hawaii when I was younger because my dad worked for the airlines, and um, so it was less expensive for us to go fly over to Hawaii than it was to get in the car and drive someplace. And mm -hmm. I was really blessed to have those experiences as well as summer camps and and that time in nature and growing up near the beach and things like that. And I, I agree, I think in years gone by before we got so industrialized, um, that people were much more in tune with the cycles, the seasons, the the sense of nature. It was just much more a part and a way of life. Um, you know, being able to roll around in the grass and play in all these things more out in the open spaces. And um, I think it's something that we can't afford to lose personally. And when we're not in those open spaces, bringing it in through music or bringing some of that essence through is definitely a gift. I know you, you like to really immerse yourself, I mean, both in Hawaii, and then I think I read also you like to get out and mountain bike. Is that true, too? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm in Colorado right now, and and uh, well, I think the best thing about being here is the mountain biking. It's really, really beautiful to be, you know, like deep in nature, you know, by the rivers or in the mountains and just you know, working your body and, you know, looking at the beautiful scenery and then kind of stopping to meditate or whatever, you know, it's, it's really one of the best things about being here. It's not, it's not as exciting as paddle boarding and commuting with the whales, you know, <laughs> off the coast of Maui, but it's, you know, it's just different. It's the, the masculine, you know, here and the feminine in Hawaii, you know, kind of the polarized kind of energy with the Rocky Mountains versus the, the ocean. Mhm. Mm I, I can definitely relate to that. I'm in southern Utah, not far from Zion National Park, myself, and mm -hmm. we also have some great mountain biking and uh, canyon areas and things like that to to oh, yeah. experience. Yeah, and it's um, you know it really is an experience. You know, they're just different. Like you say, they're different settings, and and I actually in part of my work. Uh, in a in a workshops that I call personal emergence, um, utilize nature because I find it to be such a great teacher for us. I find it, it everything that we need to know about life. I think if we just spent time in nature, we would have every answer, pretty mm -hmm. much, because nature I holds. I agree. It's like you were, we're encoded, we're one. Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's we are kind of, you know, the, the highest vibrational manifestation of, of nature, you know. Hum, humans are, ideally. Definitely. It, it's, um, you know, and I think that's the thing for us to keep in mind is we're not really, we're different, but we're not separate from it by any means. Uh, we've got a song that I'm going to go ahead and put on here. 
that is from your Call of Love CD, and it's called Breath of Life. And this comes from, I believe, a collection of CDs that you have that's your nature series. Am I correct on that? Call of Love? No. No, that's... So you tell you were you talking about my element series or something? I think you're talking about maybe your element. Yeah. Yeah. No, this was okay. actually my second collaboration with Dominic Miller. So he's he's pretty predominant on this track as well. Okay, then let's go ahead and put that on. And this is called Breath of Life.
was the breath of life. For those of you that are just joining us, we are um, talking with Peter Cater, seven-time Grammy nominee, and he's here with us tonight sharing his music, sharing his work, and sharing his insights behind the music and letting us get to know him a little bit. Um, anything that you want to share about that piece, Peter, with us? Um, more just that, you know, that was really, um, just a treat, you know, to, to play that with those musicians, you know, Paul McCandless played, um, oboe on that song and Paul McCandless is, he's one of the, the heroes of instrumental music, um, who played with the Paul Winter Consort and still plays with his own group called Oregon, um, since the late seventies and um Paul Winter and uh, the group Oregon, they were kind of like the 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 people that really broke the ground of instrumental music with deeper deeper meaning and deeper feeling and, and substance that was not in the classical or jazz um genre. And uh so Paul was one of my heroes, you know, for a couple of decades before I actually had the nerve to ask him to play with me. And so just to have him on my records at all is a is a total treat and an honor. He's a just an amazing person, musician. I think that's so great and and this is something that I really loved as I was delving into reading about different things with you that you you really have this humbleness. You you really have this way about you where you're so appreciative of the people you've gotten to work with and um, just really, you know, in, into those different, those different aspects. And I, I know that you've done a lot of collaborations um, along the way. Do you, do you have any particular stories that come up for you as far as when you started out maybe that, um, uh, you know, of, of how you connected with a couple of these people? Uh, well, it's always been very kind of genuine, you know, like um, I remember that when I was, um, you know, doing this sort of contemporary jazz thing nationally and had, a, you know, several records out that were in the top 10 of the contemporary jazz charts nationally. And I was playing and headlining at some jazz festivals and and feeling relatively unnurtured by the whole genre and the whole scene. And um, and then someone gave me a, a, a cassette, actually. Um, at the time of uh, our Carlos Nakai, the Native American flutist. And I put it on and it was like, wow, it was just, it was solo Native American flute, you know, just played just so peacefully and serenely and with so much breath and so much, you know, it had this real authentic kind of sense of like, wow, this was played out in the grasslands or, you know, in the prairie somewhere, you know, it was like, it was really kind of mesmerizing. And then I, there was enough space in the music to where I started to play the piano along to it. And um, and I thought, wow, this sounds really cool. You know, the piano and the flute. I've never heard that done before, you know, the, the native flute. I mean, I just basically got introduced to the native flute, so Native American flute. And uh, I was always interested in Native American cultures, indigenous cultures, matriarchal cultures. And um, so I thought, wow, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to track this guy down and see if he wants to um, do something. <laughs> I had no idea, you know, I mean, cause the album cover is like, he's wearing a headdress and native American, you know, leather and stuff. And I thought, you know, I mean, does, is he living a teepee or, or, you know, where do I find <laughs> him? And so I tracked down the label Canyon records and, and, uh, you know, told him that I was interested in, in talking with him and working with him. And he called me, one day, and he kind of took a leap of faith, you know, and met me in Denver at the time. I remember picking him up at the airport, and you know, I've never been, uh, I've never been friends with a Native American before, you know. And I picked him up in the car, and you know, like sitting there looking forward and not looking at me, and he's not talking, and you know, <laughs> like, oh my God, what are we gonna do? And, um, like this is one one long car right ahead of us. <laughs> yeah, and and I was nervous, and he was nervous, and 
And then we got to the recording studio and, you know, put up his mic and put the mics on the piano and kind of had a really brief conversation about the, the seven directions, the Native American seven directions, north, south, east, west, up, down, and in. And uh, um, and then we started to play. And, and all the awkwardness and all the, the silence and all the unknown, like totally totally disappeared and all of a sudden we were we were locked in i mean it's still the, that way to this day when he and i play together we're just we're just locked in you know it's like it's almost uncanny and uh our music was way way more evolved than our personalities and um so it was a great experience and i've been fortunate to have those kinds of experiences with several musicians that i you know really admire and respect and Music is a language that, I mean, just it transcends culture, sex, uh, you know, societal status, anything, obviously. I mean, that's why it's so important in our world, and that's why it's existed, you know, for thousands and hundreds of thousands of years in some form or another. And um, so it's, it's, an, it's an honor and a privilege, really, to, to, to be involved in an in, in art form like that. And, and not have to work doing anything else, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. It, it's so interesting, and, and I I find that my own path has been unfolding in that very organic way. And, you know, we talked about those timing factors, and I've been doing my work for over 33 years, but it's only been really in the last year and a half or so that I've taken this specific piece of the path and it's been amazing to me to watch those organic connections just unfold, like out of the blue. People just contact me and and say, "I've got to work with you." <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I've got to I've got to have you as a piece of what I'm doing. And I can only imagine for him at that same time, like, okay, who's this who's this guy calling me up telling me I've got to have piano with my music? <laughs> and yeah. um, you know what a great what a great experience. But like you say, you know sometimes we do have that awkwardness to start with. But as we delve into it, it just unfolds in ways that are beyond amazing for us. And um, so definitely, what a what a great experience. Now one of the the pieces we have to share tonight um, is a collaborative piece that you did with Snotam Kaur. Snotam Kaur. Mm-hmm. Car, okay, yep. and um, I knew I was going to get that <laughs> pronunciation Every, a little. Everyone does there, it. Uh, but what about how you connected with her, and how did that come about for you? It was kind of the same thing, you know. When I when I moved to Maui like five six years ago, um, I also got into yoga and started, you know doing yoga, which was kind of like life changing as well. And they played, you know, some of her music in the yoga classes. And I was like, who is that? Who is that? You know? And so I started listening to her, her music and uh, just really, really loved it and still do. And, um, and so I just, you know, it was one of those things where I just felt like, wow, you know, it would be cool to do something with her. And so I, again, I called called her her uh, manager her husband actually and um you know just introduced myself and said that I would love to do a collaboration and and uh and he thought that was a great idea and so we we went about doing that and um so then we have this one record together called Heart of the Universe and, and that's the one that we have the song from so I'm going to go ahead and get that one playing. This this particular song is called Soft Like Wax. Mm-hmm. And um, let's go ahead and get this started.
And that was Soft Like Wax from the Heart of the Universe CD, um, collaboration of Peter Cater and Snotum Kaur. Uh, beautiful piece. I mean, she's got a beautiful voice that just complements your piano incredibly. Yeah, yeah, she does have a beautiful voice. Yeah. So um, definitely a, a very... I don't know. When I listen to that, we talk about the transcendence, <laughs> and it's just there, the way the two of them, you know, the two of you merge together there. It's just incredible. I think I just kind of drift away <laughs> when I get into that song there. Um, you know, Peter, like a lot of um, people that are, are in the same kind of genre of music that you are, uh, you also create music for healing or healing style of music. And I know earlier this year I had Stephen Halpern on and we were discussing his music and healing aspects through brainwave patterns. But is there something in your healing series that provides this for people? Is there something in my healing series that provides what for people? Um, that that creates or, or provides healing through the music. Yeah. I mean, that's the feedback I get anyway, that um, my music has been used in, for, I guess, many people's uh, healing process, whether it's emotional, spiritual, or sometimes even physical. Um, and I think that's because I go to my music for even my own self-healing and my self-balancing, you know, and I'm always looking for that 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 deeper resonance, you know, that deeper compassion and intimacy with myself. Um, and I think it just kind of vibrates, like you were saying at the beginning of the show, it, it vibrates within within the sound, within the notes, you know, like, like you were saying, you can, you know, different people can play a chord or hit a note on, a, on an instrument and depending on who's playing it, it'll have a different resonance about it. And um, based on where they're coming from in their, in themselves and their lives and, and what level of intimacy they're experiencing and what level of compassion and love they're experiencing as they're doing it. And um, so the, the music that I've done for the healing arts is really all about that because back in the, in the eighties, I've always been like a, you know, a healing arts junkie, whether it's, you know, body work or gestalt or, you know, Reiki or, you know, some kind of therapy, Rolfing, Feldenkrais, you know, whatever it is. And, you know, in a lot of those situations, people were playing classical music. And I'm thinking to myself, what does this classical music that was written for social events, you know, 200 years ago have to do with my healing process? And um, so I decided to record some music that I thought would be really, really appropriate and beneficial to the to the healing process and kind of create a, a container, you know, like a safe, nurturing container that would allow people the opportunity and, and, the, and the safety and freedom to kind of just drop deeper into themselves, whether they're doing breath work or massage or, you know, whatever modality they're into. And um, because I wanted it, you know, I needed it. And so that's a big part of what I really enjoy doing. You know, that's why I was so unhappy at the jazz festivals. It's like, well, really, I really want to play music for you to get drunk and hit on that woman. You know, it's like <laughs> <laughs> not, not really why I became a musician. And um, so I was so happy to kind of like turn the corner and, and go back into like, you know, oh, oh, you used my music for the birth of your child or you used my music while you were getting chemo or, you know, your father's death or your, you know, whatever, those meaningful, your wedding, you know, those meaningful things in life that are that are really the the, the, the foundation of, of who we are and, and what makes us human, you know, and, and, and deep, you know, that's, those are the kinds of things that I'm much more interested in being associated with. 
And, and that reinforces that walking your talk aspect that I had mentioned earlier as well, because it it really comes down to, I mean, I, I know the same thing as I've started to move myself forward with what I'm doing right now. And people say, oh, well, you can't really do what you want and you're not going to make a, you know, you you got to do these other things in order to, you know, really cover what you want to do. And I say, no, you don't. <laughs> you don't, because if your heart's not in those things, they're not going to end up paying off for you. So why would I take that direction? You know, what I want to do is really provide these experiences. And, and that's the same place you're coming from. It's like, that's where I want to see my music is in these these areas that are healing in those yoga studios and in those massage rooms where people are really needing those experiences and and it is powerful and I find in times even from my own experience of when I've needed to do healing that or or gone and gotten a massage or been in a yoga room or things like that that the music was a real asset, if they had the right music, it really made a difference in what I received during that mm. session. Yeah, it so really such... made a huge difference. I totally so, agree. And you you have a piece that we brought in that, that comes from, it was listed under your healing series anyway, so a Walk in Beauty CD, and the oh. song is Sweet Embrace, and... Um, what I what I gathered on this was that this was designed with a focus of balance, grace, right action, right relations, and to bring about purpose and vision. Yes, it was a collaboration I did with Native American flutist Joseph Firepro, and uh, yeah, so that was the intention. I think it turned out pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I would say I've been turning it out really good. <laughs> this is Sweet Embrace, and this comes from Peter's Walk in Beauty CD.
Well, it's such a, such a nice piece, and again, that was Sweet Embrace uh, from the Walk in Beauty CD, which is part of the healing series done by Peter Cater. Um, really just, uh, I, I, I wish I was getting a massage or something <laughs> listening to that <laughs> as we speak. I, it's it's great, but the, the healing comes in so many ways, whether it's meditational or or through these other things, and and I think you've just really did an incredible collaboration between the Native American flute and the and the piano on that. Um, Thank you. Really, really beautifully done, and it does. It, I think the the addition of the the Native American flute with that, for me, anyways, really brings out a lot of that healing vibration, and it kind of connects with what we were talking about with nature earlier that it brings out that natural kind of primordial rhythm um, that just kind of tunes you into nature, which is what heals. Mm -hmm. Um, Beautiful. Um, Thank you. I'm just just happy to be (laughs) sharing all of this tonight. I really am. Um, Now, you also tend to involve yourself and a lot of different interesting uh, projects, and this spans everywhere. I know earlier you, you're you're one of those people I was really surprised when I got on and read. I was like, gosh, he still does these amazing, more intimate performances that I just, you know, I I think it blows my mind to, to think about somebody doing that that's made some of the achievements you've made. And one of the things that I saw that you had done recently was an evening in your home with Neil Donald Walsh, Walsh, um, mm-hmm. and that was one of the things you did. You also do work with a lot of charitable contributions. Um, maybe you can, and I believe the Light Body CD is one of those that when people purchase that one, um, the, the CD and the prints that contributes to charitable organizations. Am I correct on that? Yeah, the CD is a strong support of um, hospice. Um, the, the the concept for the CD was originally, like, my friend Tricia Bowden approached me one day and she said, you know, she said, I'm kind of nervous about asking you this because, you know, it's kind of like like off off the main mainstream a bit. Um have you ever thought about doing a record for hospice, for hospice support? And um, and I was like, yeah, totally. I was absolutely interested and had thought about doing that for a while. And um, so, uh, you know, we went about doing that and uh, decided to align the CD with the seven chakras um, as kind of a map beginning with the, the the first chakra, the root chakra, and then moving up. And, um, yeah, it's all about supporting that transitionary process that we all have to go through. And it's all, you know, it's also great music just for the healing arts in general, for energy work and healing work of all kinds. So uh, it's a record I'm really proud of. It's actually my most recent album, and it got a Grammy nomination last year, so it was my eighth Grammy nomination. Wow. Mm-hmm. And, and that's amazing, because uh, um, I, I know when Steve Halborn was on the show, he had mentioned, you know, he lived for the day that people in the New Age genre would be able to even be eligible to get a Grammy <laughs> or even be nominated. Mm-hmm. And to be in your position to to just keep having your work nominated over and over and over again, to me, just speaks volumes. I mean, not because of the credential itself, but because of the impact that it's having on people, that they're listening to it. It's it's making these top 20 lists, these top 10 lists on the charts. And... I think that that's a powerful thing. And again, that comes back to when your heart's in it, when you're doing these things that care. And and with you, it's obviously 
is about the music. It is about the energy. It is about reaching people. And it's not just about the money and how many CDs can we sell. Um, granted, you've done very, very well, but I, I think this is such an amazing thing. Like I said, as I delved into your work more and more, that I was, I was looking at it going, I mean, it never ends where you're giving, <laughs> which is is fantastic. It, it, you know, to see that much of it, to see you just going, yes, yes. You know, the universe is knocking on your door and you're saying yes. Mm-hmm. I hear you. So very, very powerful there. Um, and I love... I love, too, that you aligned it to the seven chakras for hospice care. I think I do a lot of work with the chakras myself, and I think that's one of those things that that when you have it designed that way, it really helps in, in maybe the releasing, the calming, the soothing, the whole, kind of like the whole package for that time mm-hmm. of life. Yeah. Then it's and it's definitely a, a area and a group um, that I think isn't given enough attention to. Well, especially in this culture, you know, we like to pretend that people don't really die. You know, <laughs> right? We, we we try to you know we try to keep that away from our mainstream awareness. Um, so, but it's obviously a very very important part of of everyone's life. But you know, it's like there's also all the little deaths as well. You know, it's like it's I I really it's for me it's definitely not just about hospice and just leaving these bodies behind. It's about it's about spiritual growth. You know, it's about all the all the deaths and rebirths that we experience on our paths on a regular basis and probably more than ever. You know, in the last couple years, few years, or maybe even just in the last year, and, you know, there's a lot of change going on, and a lot of things are needing to be, you know, let go of and transformed in some way, so, I mean, the whole death-rebirth process is, I think, more active in our lives than ever, I would imagine. I think that's true for me, anyway. I I agree, and, and that is a really good point, because there's so much of our society that focuses on, oh, you can't age. We got to have this youth formula, and you've got to have this, and you've got to, you know, at 60, you got to look like that 25 year old used to look. <laughs> and, you know, it's, you know, it's really, as you say, about embracing the cycles all throughout life. It's not just the body and what it's doing, but it is, it's all those little deaths. And, and I know that. I've had numerous ones along the way, and it, they are equally as powerful. You literally are stepping into a new life, and it is part of the natural cycle of things. It's the way everything works. I mean, you look, you know, going back to nature, you look at nature. You know, plants run through the season. You know, the trees come out, and they, the leaves come out at one time of the year. They grow. They fullen up. They lose their leaves. They die off. You, you know, for the winter season, they go dormant. They come back. It's all part of the natural process, and mm. to not embrace that, to me, seems just completely unnatural. Totally. I've got, uh, we've got two pieces, actually, from um, this this work, and we have um, one that's related to the solar plexus, one that's related to the heart chakra, and... I'm going to go ahead and start with the solar plexus because I think that that's um, that's one of the ones that really I think for a lot of people they they have a tough time allowing themselves those little depths um, come about with that one and this one is right here.
And that um, that was the solar plexus chakra um, piece that is coming off of a, a CD, light body CD, which the there's a piece of the sales that do go to hospice charitable organizations for that. Um, definitely a, a CD worth checking out. I, it's amazing, Peter, every time I listen to that, that piece, I can just feel this whole opening right in <laughs> in my solar plexus. And it, mm. it just never amazes me every time. I, it just comes through and it's like, oh, that just feels so good. <laughs> <laughs> just like That's a big great. warm hug inside my solar plexus. It's it's wonderful. <laughs> I'm glad. Oh, man. Beautiful, beautiful work. Um, so So many... Wonderful things that you, you we've been delving into tonight here from the different aspects of your music and um, certainly you know you the pieces that we haven't touched on tonight have been related. You've done a lot of musical scores and or not musical scores but um, scores for for movies mm-hmm. and uh, Broadway and these different areas. Um, any anything about that that has been um, you know, it seems like a whole different area from the rest of your music, but I, I'm sure that that's all tied together well also. <laughs> yeah, that. it's all tied together. Um, but it's fun, you know, doing doing music for the Broadway and the off-Broadway stuff was really fun and interesting and challenging in a different way. And, you know, writing for different films or TV things is also challenging in a different way um but it's all you know comes from the same place you know kind of following your intuition and and um opening up to the creative process and you know it's it's really all all connected like you said yeah definitely and it, it it does show through and you've certainly had some very notable pieces in that arena um I know that you're also getting ready to release a brand new work, um, and and that's untitled yet for its CD. Um, mm-hmm. But I'd love for you to share a little bit more about you know what what that work is and and what that means to you, because that'll be out what in September is it? Yeah, September. Yeah, it's an untitled CD with untitled songs. I mean, the the music's really about like um like inner inner discipline discipline like an inner spiritual discipline whether it's uh you know yoga or tai chi or some form of meditation or or something but it's it's about inner work and the music is kind of it's kind of serious you know like it's definitely not as melodic as some of my other stuff and um it's it really creates a very very i i think a very deep kind of space that's uh pretty powerful if I don't mind saying so and um, so I'm trying to figure out you know the right what to call it you know because it's, it's granted it's only a word or a title but it does kind of lead people to to the project in, in a certain way you know and uh, I often name my songs last because the, the you know the music doesn't really have a name you know music is more like a feeling so much larger than any name could be and um so it's often kind of one of the more challenging parts of releasing a record it's like well what do we call it how do we package it what do we name the song but um i'm really i'm really proud of this record too it's got some really great great spaces in it that are that are unique that i've never done before and uh, and and i am going to share a piece from that to close the show out tonight. Okay. Um, so we, we will be getting to that um, when we get ready to close it. And and it is a beautiful piece. I think that, you know, again, you've got a lot of collaborations on this work. Um, some of the ones I think I remember seeing was Michael Fitzpatrick on cello, Todd Boston on acoustic guitar, Trish Bowden on wordless vocals. Um, mm. So, again, a lot, of, a lot of people contributing on this. And, I'm sure this is one of those things where it's, and I deal with this sometimes, you have a title bouncing around and 
something maybe just isn't kind of coming out, and then when the time's right, that door just opens. Mm -hmm. And you just, that's it. <laughs> that's what I'm looking for. Right. And, it, and it all comes together. And, and, you know, that's one of those things where I think so many people try to force something to happen. They try to force something to come about by a certain time. And, and when you operate organically and when you're operating from this heartfelt space that you do, the time is less important than having it just flow out of you. Mm-hmm. True. We can't really control the process. You know, we can engage in it and surrender to it, but we can't really control it. So. And and that letting go again, that surrendering, and it, and I know when I can just get still and do that surrender. It's like that's where I get the access, and that's where everything just flows in. So I never really have to worry about is this going to be the right thing, or this has to come to me by a certain point, or anything like that. I've, I've learned that you got to just let go of time <laughs> for one thing, and then and then when you're just still, it just happens. It just flows in. And, mm -hmm. and I kind of sense that with you. I sense that that's something that you do. You you have this stillness to a certain extent that when you're creating works, it just naturally is flowing. Yep. That's true. Uh, now, are there any other events or performances that are coming up? We talked about your book, Healing Through Creativity, which is coming out. Is it... Um, that you're working on, which is going to be exciting. And I believe I also saw coming up in February, February 9th through 15th of 2014, you've got a full moon Valentine's week in Maui that, that incorporates yoga, music, whales, and yeah. paradise, as you said. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. that's going to be quite a week. The full moon, the full moon is actually on Valentine's night on um February 14th and uh so the whole week is going to just build up towards the full moon and we're going to be on Maui doing all my favorite things yoga, music, swimming, paddleboarding, communing with the whales, great food. Um I've done I think three or four of these retreats so far. And uh so this one I'm really looking forward to a lot. So you all should come. There'll be more uh, information I, about on my website. And your website again is petercater.com, which we have at the bottom of the show description. It's P E T E R K A T E R dot com. And it, it one of the things I love on your website is you, you do have all these samples on there where people can really get a feel whether that's the C D for them or not. And You've got it broken out very well in there. Um, really, really a pleasure to go on there. And certainly anybody who's interested in joining Peter in Maui in February for Valentine's Week, worth going onto his website. Check it out. Get signed up. But it sounds like an incredible time to me. I, I can't. I mean, it sounds like a great way to spend that week. <laughs> yeah. I think it, it would just be amazing to have those experiences of, of being indulged in the, the music and the yoga and the whales during that time, um, especially with that full moon energy, would be very powerful and very beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, but I would definitely like to thank you for being here tonight, sharing your time with us, um, letting us look into the window a little bit of, of who you are and the person behind the music and sharing all of your incredible music and different areas of music with us tonight. Well, thanks for having me, Jesse. It's been really fun talking with you, and thanks for inviting me. And it's, uh, it's great to be able to talk about more of what's going on around all the music that people just kind of hear without really knowing much about the background or anything. And to me, the background is just so important. It's such an important part of the music, and it just gives you a whole other insight when you do listen to it. And um, hopefully you won't mind if I buy a couple of your CDs and use them and some things I'm doing <laughs> with 
work and meditative work and other things as well. Um, yeah, it'd be great. What I do because, uh, I think it's definitely an asset to helping people grow. Mm-hmm. So, again, thank you so very much for this time and the space um, tonight with you. And thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Next week here on Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour, I will have Leslie Davenport with us. She does integrated therapy and guided imagery. She will be sharing how to do self-guided imagery so that you can learn how to work with it on your own. Um, I've got several events coming up myself here, and you can find out about those at jessieannicholsgeorge.eventbrite.com. And they're happening throughout the end of August. Matter of fact, that ties in with my August special. Um, you have the opportunity to participate in some of my workshops at a greatly reduced rate. They're going to be available for $75, which is a little over half off of what I normally have for those workshops, and they are full-day workshops. So um, to take advantage of that, just uh, go right um, on into the jessieannicholsgeorge.eventbrite.com site, pick the website you want, and you can enter code 777, and that will get you uh, that discounted price on there. So that's for any of the workshops that are happening in Cedar City, Utah, um, during the month of August. Also, I've started providing some online courses for people, and I'm going to be doing those at very affordable rates. I I want to give some people the opportunity who maybe can't travel, can't commute into the area um, or or attend some of the bigger workshops. And what those will be is most of those will be ranging in the $10 to $25 range for people. And there will be like mini versions of my workshops. I'm going to be doing things that will be um, work for the cycles of the year, the moon cycles. And those are normally going to be about an hour, some of the bigger ones, maybe two hours. And you can go on, actually, it's a, it's a great little area, to learnitlive.com forward slash invite forward slash Jesse and Nichols George. And that will get you in, and you can see all the, the events that are available and happening there. And there's actually, I put up about probably a little around 30 events or so, 30 happenings there. So with those, I'm talking a little bit about what's going on, giving some insights, giving some education um, about the topic, but I'm also going to be doing meditations and visualizations and energy work in that process as well. So uh, go ahead and check those out. There's, uh, like I said, a lot of great, great offerings there. I also want to mention, don't forget that we have several shows here on Main Street Universe throughout the week. Sunday nights, we have Darren Bacare, who's a reader at Madame Laveau in New Orleans, uh, doing spiritual insights. Monday nights is Kevin Baird, walking on the sidewalk. Uh, He uses his Horizon Oracle Journeys deck, a deck that he created, and you can learn more about that on his website at templeofgaia.com. Of course, Wednesday nights is our flagship show. We have Daniel, Denise, and Brett hosting that show. And Thursdays, we have Queen Mother Amaku discussing her work with Egyptian culture. And then, of course, Friday nights is Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour. This is Jesse Ann Nichols-George. I want to thank you so much for being here tonight. I look forward to seeing you and would love to have you back here next week as we delve more into Activating Compassion. And don't forget, if you've enjoyed the show this evening, to share it with others. It's going to be available at the same link in our archives. And I'm going to be leaving you with a song tonight Uh, from Peter's work, and it's his soon-released CD, which is not named yet, but the the name of the song uh, that he's given me for this piece is called Lumeria. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you again next week right here on Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour. May you enjoy the rest of your weekend and have an amazing week. Mm -hmm.